Alexis has an impressive record in her professional work, and more specifically, in NCFR. Her teaching and research related to feminism, families, aging, and especially caregiving have led to numerous articles, several books, and a solid record of grant support for her activities. Service is a hallmark of Alexis's life. This is evidenced in activities like manuscript reviewing and with us, organizational involvement. She provides her colleagues and her students with a very solid, positive role model. In NCFR, she has served us well in more capacities than I dare to enumerate. A peak contribution for her and for us, in addition to the presidency, has been her work which was instrumental in the birth, development, and nurturing of the Feminism and Family Studies section, which was fondly acknowledged by many last night at the reception in her honor. Her most recent honor was also announced earlier, but I want to repeat it because it's very significant. By, it was announced by her Dean Kinsey Green at the opening plenary session. Alexis has been named the first person to hold the Joanne Peterson Endowed Chair in Gerontology and Family Studies at Oregon State University. It is with great pleasure I present to you a friend, a colleague, and NCFR President Alexis Walker. Thank you very much. One can't be lonely among friends. I realize that no one here has a remote control device, so you will not be able to change this channel. Um, this is your opportunity to leave if you don't want to hear this talk. First, I thank the following individuals who were most helpful to me in preparing this address. Dr. Kinsey Green, Dean of the College, of Home Economics and Education at Oregon State University, provided funds to support a research assistant who was very helpful to me. Alan Acock, the head of my department, released me from a course during my past academic year when I had many NCFR responsibilities. And the following individuals assisted with measurement and the collection, coding, and analysis of data. Lori Schreiner, Students enrolled in Human Development and Family Sciences 442 Gender and Family Relationships in the spring of 1994. Takashi Yamamoto, Linda Eddy, who helped me um, train interviewers, as well as will help tonight, today with the overheads. Janet Lee, Rebecca Warner, Sally Bowman, Fu Song Lee, and John Bratton. And for reading and commenting on a draft of this manuscript, Mark Fine and Catherine Allen. Five years ago, my parents bought a second television set because my mother refused to watch television with my father any longer. <laughs> I can't stand the way he flips through the channels, she said. Note that my father actually has the new television. My mother was relegated to the den with the older model. Nevertheless, she now has her own set, and conflicts about the remote control device, known as the RCD in the broadcasting and communications literature, are much reduced. Three years ago, Ellen Goodman published an essay in which she described the RCD as, quote, the most reactionary implement currently used to undermine equality in modern marriage. <laughs> Around the same time, I began to notice comic strips such as these. And you may have trouble seeing this. This is a marriage counselor with a couple, and the wife is saying, we got along for 40 years, then we got remote control. <laughs> this is a Pickles uh, comic strip. 
the cat at the Pickles residence is climbing up the uh, curtains and getting to see an overhead view. The cat says, everything looks different from up here. Wow, I never knew the old man was bald. <laughs> Muffin, get down from there. Notice the husband clicking there with the remote. How many times have I told you to stay off the curtains? <laughs> click, click, click. <laughs> a squirt gun is a good way to break a cat of bad habits. <laughs> and you can stop channel shopping too. <laughs> and husbands too. Shortly thereafter, I needed to come up with a project for students enrolled in my upper division course on gender and family relationships. Why not, I thought, use this relatively unresearched topic of couples in the RCD to stimulate student curiosity and at the same time pursue my feminist-inspired interest in the mundane experience of everyday life. Over the past 20 years, feminist scholars have shown that ordinary, routine, run-of-the-mill activities that take place inside homes every day bear an uncanny resemblance to the social structure. For example, the distribution of household labor and of child care is gendered in the same way that paid work is gendered. The more boring and the less desirable tasks are disproportionately performed by women. And status has a way of reducing men's, but not women's, participation in these tasks. Examining television watching behavior was a way to extend the feminist analysis to leisure activity. Despite the fact that television watching is the dominant leisure activity in the United States today, there is little research on this topic in family studies. There's actually fairly little research on leisure in family studies. Although scholars often mention that employed wives and mothers have very little of it. <laughs> there is a considerable literature on gender and leisure in the field of leisure studies, I discovered. For example, Henderson described women's leisure as fragmented because much of it takes place at home, wherein it is mingled with domestic labor. In comparison to men, women say that leisure is less of a priority. They also say that they don't deserve it. Some activities that are defined as leisure pursuits, such as family picnics, are actually occasions for women's work. <laughs> this makes leisure a possible source of conflict for women. Henderson called for a deconstruction of leisure because the term embodies contradictions for them. To develop a way of measuring couple television watching behavior, I sought guidance from the research on television watching, which amazingly enough is also considerable. Here studies describe grazing. That's moving through one or more channels um, with no more than five seconds on any one channel, <laughs> at least three, four, five, I'm sure you've seen this. Another is zapping. Zapping is switching to avoid something, such as a commercial. Still a third is zipping. <laughs> zipping is fast forwarding during a pre-recorded program, typically to avoid commercials. Zipping is the way I like to use the remote control device, and it's a source of conflict between me and my partner. Observational, survey, in-depth interview, and ethnographic data from communications researchers who have studied a wide variety of families using multiple different kinds of sampling techniques have revealed that when heterosexual families with children watch television together, fa fathers dominate in program selection and in the use of the RCD. Sons are active as well. They use the device more than either their mothers or their sisters. That gender differences are smaller among younger persons, however, suggests the potential for declining for women and men to be more similar in their RCD use in the future. 
Morley described fathers as using the RCD for unnegotiated channel switching. That is, changing channels when they want to without consulting or explaining they, their behavior to other watchers. Unemployed fathers, by the way, are less likely to use the RCD in this way. Why so much channel switching? If you ask men why they switch so much, according to Morley, they say they switch to avoid commercials, to see if something better is on, to see what they're missing, to keep from having to look it up in the printed listings, <laughs> to watch news reports. Some say they do it to annoy others. <laughs> And my favorite reason of all, to watch more than one program at the same time. <clears throat> By contrast, if you ask women, they say, to watch a specific program. A frightening finding is that children of heavy RCD control users are also heavy users. <laughs> suggesting that parents pass on this behavior and that we have more grazing to look forward to in the future. <laughs> Copeland and Schweitzer concluded in their review of the literature, men have usually been viewed as the persons who control program selection and domination of the remote control seems to make visually explicit what ha may have been previously implicit. This notion of power, clearly stated in the language of communications researchers, is missing from the family research on leisure. Yet the communications researchers have found, um, have primarily focused their research on parents watching television together with their children. There is little research on couples watching television together nor is there much research on what other things people might be doing while they're watching television. Also, questions that are of interest to those of us who study close relationships have not been included. For example, are there ways in which watching television with your partner is frustrating? Would you change the way that you watch television with your partner if you could? And how do you influence your partner to watch something that you want to watch? These questions address the latent power issues described by Afghi Compter. She demonstrated that power is not only evident in the direct observable resolution of conflict between partners, but also in covert or non-observable events. Examples are the ability to prevent issues from being raised, the anticipation of the desires of the more powerful partner, and resignation to an undesirable situation. Compter included leisure in her study, but her focus was on sexual interaction, hobbies, and interaction with friends. I wanted to apply the concept of latent power to the study of the mundane behavior of joint television watching with the use of the RCD. The sample for this study was characterized by its diversity. I sought to include married, heterosexual cohabiting, and gay and lesbian couples, both white and non-white pairs, couples in new relationships and couples in long-term relationships, and couples from a diversity of socioeconomic statuses. Nearly 14% of the 36 couples, or 72 individuals in this sample, were gay or lesbian. But here, and for much of this report, I focus attention on the 31 heterosexual pairs, 86% of the sample. Women and men did not differ from each other in socio-demographic characteristics, so I present the characteristics for the sample, the heterosexual sample as a whole. The typical respondent was 34 years of age, and you can see from this overhead that about the largest group had some college, but they're relatively um, distributed uh, with 16% having high school education or less. There's a little bit of a highly educated group. As far as race, t almost 23% of the sample was non-white. The um, categories included African American and um, Hispanic and a number of people of mixed race. 
in terms of relationship type, about uh, three quarters of the sample were married, 58% in their first marriage. Another quarter of the sample was cohabiting. Three quarters of the sample was employed. Those who were not were mostly retired. There were a few students and a few homemakers. In terms of annual household income, basically you can look at the sample as being in three groups. About a third, middle class, $20,000 to $39,999 a year. Um, another third, less than $20,000, and another third, $40,000 or over. About one third had children living at home. A coin toss was used to determine which partner to interview first. Partners were interviewed separately, usually in their own homes, and interviews were audio taped and transcribed. First, some basics. On average, these couples had 1.8 television sets. Some had only one, some had as many as five. <laughs> Two people living in the home, five television sets. <laughs> they had 1.3 VCRs, um, some had as many as three. They also had 1.3 remote control devices. The typical home had basic cable or a satellite dish for some people who lived in rural areas. Uh, a number of cables had additional um, cable options and one frightening couple had two satellite dishes. <laughs> <clears throat> What about their television watching behavior? Men watch television significantly more often than women, although women watch quite a bit, on average almost daily. Men's average was daily. Let's look at the first figures for additional information. I ask people first, how happy are you watching television with your partner? Almost everybody thinks this is a wonderful experience. <laughs> And typically, they watch television together five days a week. But if I ask them, um, are there any things about your joint television watching behavior that's frustrating, two-thirds of the women and um, three in five of the men say yes. The interview transcriptions are revealing about these frustrations. A number of women complained about their partner's grazing behavior, both during a show and when they first turned the television on. One woman said, I would say that the only thing that's frustrating for me is when we first turn on the TV and he just flips through the channels. It drives me crazy because you can't tell what's on because he just goes through and goes through and goes through. Another woman said, I get frustrated only if I get hooked into one show and then he flips it to another one. As soon as I get hooked into that one, he flips it to something else. <laughs> Such reports from women were common. A man said, we don't watch TV a lot together. I would rather do other activities with my wife. And then he volunteered. Channel switching wasn't a problem until the remote control. I have gotten some bad habits from the place I work. In my free time at my job, you learn how to channel surf. <laughs> Many men indicated that their women partners were bothered by this behavior. Men's frustrations tended to be around the quality of the programming or the circumstances of watching rather than remote control activity. For example, I wish we had a VCR. I wish we had one of those TVs where you could watch two things on the screen at once. <laughs> Another said, it's sort of frustrating when I want to watch something that she doesn't, and she goes into the other room and then gets sort of pouty about it. <laughs> a third said, no. Nothing is frustrating, but she does talk a little while I'm trying to watch television. Well, where is the remote control device usually located? 
we asked people, where is the remote control device usually located? This figure indicates if they, if they say I do, it means I'm holding it or it's right near me. 16% of the women say I'm holding it or it's right near me. 48% of the men. 84% of the women say it's never near them and they're never holding it. Um, and about half of the men say that as well. This is what they say about the typical thing. For about 40% of the time, the remote control device is actually in a neutral location. That means either partner has access to it. Some, or this also includes some couples where they take turns having it near them. <laughs> the pattern was the same when we asked people about the RCD's location during the most recently jointly watched television show in the last week. In this case, 26% of the women actually said it was near them or they were holding it. And again, about half of the men. So the women, was, it was a little bit higher in this case. The transcriptions support this pattern as well. A husband said, I usually use the remote because I know how to use it. <laughs> It usually sits right in front of me while I am on the couch. A young woman said, I had the baby this time. This was a rare occasion. A young, woman, uh, a, a young man said, I frequently have the remote at my side. I won't change the channel until we're ready to look for something else. If there is someone who wants to change the channel at a commercial, it will be Sally, that's my name for his partner. I will hand the remote to her. She will change it to a favorite show and then back after the commercial and then I get the remote control back. <laughs> that is very typical, he said. His wife agreed when we asked, where was the remote control the last time you watched television together? She said, Jerry's pocket either his shirt pocket or his bathrobe pocket. <laughs> Another man said, I don't hold the RCD, but I pretty much have control of it. And if I don't care what's on, then I let her have it. <laughs> Sometimes we fight over it. Well, not fight really, but I mean it's like, you always have the remote control. <laughs> we asked participants about the remote control behaviors that were frustrating to them. Got it. Um. Oh, that's not the right thing. I'm sorry. It's uh, which. Uh, I'm sorry about this. This is my technological error. Okay. I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> And 42% of the uh, women said that there was uh, frustrating behavior around the remote control. Only 10% of the men. Notice 90% of the men say there's nothing about remote control use that bothers them. <clears throat> <laughs> what did these people say was bothersome to them? The amount of grazing, the speed of grazing, heavy use of the RCD, and taking too long to go back to a channel after switching from it during a commercial. Actually, a couple people said their own heavy RCD use bothered them. The results were the same when I examined the mean number of frustrating RCD behaviors. And by the way, these are, were significantly different. <laughs> when I asked people about other things, about watching television together that bothered them, there were no differences between men and women. And these were things like we spend too much time watching television, my partner does things that bother me, 
um, such as making fun of a program that I watch. There were not differences between men and women on these things. Well, thus far, we have seen that men watch more television than women, they control the RCD more than women, and women are more frustrated by RCD behaviors than men are. There's one more interesting difference between women and men. When we asked them about their most recent joint television watching behavior, women reported doing significantly more work while watching television than their partners did. This work included household chores, child care, and paid work. Women and men did not differ on doing other things while watching television together, such as eating or drinking or reading or doing nothing or playing computer games. And about 80% of both the women and the men described this most recent experience as typical of their joint television watching behavior. Well, what about the latent power measures? Now remember, Com Compter says one of the indications of latent power is that people are frustrated, but they don't say they are interested in changing things. One in five women said they would change the remote control behavior that occurs during their te joint television watching behavior if they could. 3% of the men said they would make such a change. When asked about specifics, there were some very interesting patterns. One of the most provocative questions was, how do you get your partner to watch a show that you want to watch? These results were particularly revealing of latent power. One woman said, I tell him this would be a good one to watch, and he says no and keeps changing the channels. Then I whine, and then he still says no. Another woman says, let me think here, when does that happen? If I really want to watch, I'll say, I want to watch this one. Or if he's not in the room, I'll say, come in here and watch this. But pretty much we watch the same things a lot, whether or not that's because I let him. He a lot of the time turns it on, and I'll come in and join him. But if it's something I really want to watch, I say, don't flip the channel, I want to see this. <clears throat> a man said he gets his partner to watch a show he wants this way. I just sneak the remote away from her if she has it. <laughs> or if I'm there first, then... <laughs> I mean, if there's sports on, that's usually what we watch unless there's something else on. I mean, usually if there's some kind of sports game on, we watch that, but unless there's another show on that, you know, she can talk me into or deter my interest or something. When asked how his partner gets him to watch something that she wants to watch, he said, oh, I guess if there's not anything that I'm real big on watching, then I'll let her choose. Or if, you know, she's really interested in something, a bunch of times we'll watch TV and it's like, well, we'll watch her show and we'll go back and it's kind of interesting and then we go back and forth. His wife agrees. I usually don't have to beg him. I don't know, I tie him down or something, she says, and then laughs. He usually just comes over and if it's not what he wants, then he'll take the remote and try to find sports. In other words, this couple watches sports. <laughs> If sports aren't available, and he doesn't have something else he really wants to watch, then they watch a show she wants to watch, but he keeps looking for sports. <laughs> Another woman is deliberate in her efforts to watch a particular show. I usually start a couple of days ahead of time. <laughs> when I see them advertised. I see it's something that I'm going to want to watch. I tell him, get prepared. <laughs> I have to be relatively adamant about it. When the time comes up, I have to remind him ahead of time, I told you earlier I want to watch this program. <laughs> I said, we asked, how, do you get, he get, how does he get you to watch something he wants to watch? She said, he just watches what he wants to watch. He doesn't ask. Finally, a man said, I just say I want to watch something, and if she wants to watch something really bad, I will let her watch what she wants to watch. 
Ultimately, the authority is his. The data are much the same when people report on changes they would like to see in the way they watch television together. One man said, I love this language, I should probably let her drive sometime. <laughs> this is using the remote. <laughs> but that would bug me too much not to be able to do it. A woman painted a brighter picture when asked, how do you feel about watching TV with your partner? Are you happy with the way things are? She responded, yes, right now. But see, without the VCR, we'd be in trouble because I just tape anything I want to see. Without that, there'd be more conflict. Buying a second TV has changed the way we watch TV. It's made it easier, less stress, less conflict. A man was also positive when asked, have you changed the way in which you watch television together? He reply, replied, we take turns watching our programs and I let her hold the remote during her programs. <laughs> With his permission, she gets to use the remote control once in a while. Earlier I mentioned that 14% of the couples in this study were gay or lesbian. Few conclusions can be drawn from these five couples, but it's useful to note some distinctiveness about these pairs. In one lesbian pair, the partners limited their television watching to avoid different styles in using the remote control device. They also specifically decided to talk to each other during the commercials so that the one partner who tended to, to uh, try to avoid commercials wouldn't do so since it was bothersome to the other. Both suggested that they compromise. If we're both here, said one, we try to make it sure that it's something we both like. A second lesbian pair was similar. Although one partner used the RCD much more often than the other, her partner said, she's perfectly willing if I say, this looks really good, she stops grazing. She doesn't dominate that way. Her partner agreed that she usually held the remote control device, but they share too. She said, if Becky has a show she really likes, then I give her the remote so I'm sure I don't play with it while she's watching her show. Note the difference. She does not let her partner hold the remote. She asks her to hold it so as to keep her own behavior in check. The data I presented here confirm that women in heterosexual pairs have less leisure time than men reflected in the amount of television couples watch and in the fact that women dovetail family labor with, with their leisure pursuits. Leisure at home for women is compatible with household chores and with childcare. Thus, women's leisure is both fragmented and a source of conflict. These data expose the contradictions between the goal and the reality of leisure for women. The data also support previous work suggesting that in heterosexual families, men dominate in program selection and in the use of the RCD. Indeed, unnegotiated channel switching was a frequent occurrence. Men use the RCD to avoid commercials, to watch more than one show at a time, and to check what else is on. And they do so even when their partners are frustrated by this behavior. The data are particularly revealing in terms of latent power. Women struggle to get their male partners to watch a program that they want to watch. And fewer women than men believe that their efforts to change their joint television watching will be successful. Power also is evident in non-observable events, such as the frustrations that I described here. In the heterosexual sample, Women seem less able to be able to raise issues of concern to them. They anticipate the struggles they will encounter when and if their own preferences are made known, and they predict a negative reaction from their male partners. Joint television watching in heterosexual couples is hardly an egalitarian experience. As was true for my mother, some women use a second television or a VCR to level the playing field. But even if affordable, a second television set reduces joint leisure time. And a VCR often means that a woman has to wait to watch her show. 
Couples watching television are not simply passive couch potatoes. They are doing gender. They are acting in ways that are consistent with the social structure. And they are helping to create and maintain that social structure at the same time. Everyday couple interaction is hardly mundane and run of the mill. It is a systematic recreation and reinforcement of social patterns. Couples leisure behavior is gendered in the same way that household labor is gendered. Social status enhances men's leisure activity relative to women. Leisure activity, as Ferry said, has gendered meanings. Women and men are creating and affirming themselves and each other as separate and unequal. In other words, leisure activity is both an occasion for relaxation and occasion for doing gender. As suggested by Osmond and Thorne, gender relations are basically power relations because the power of men in families is legitimate power that is backed by structural and cultural supports it constrains the less powerful to act so as to maintain the social order and their relationship stability. Few women make demands of their male partners so that their leisure changes. Instead, they say they are happy with their joint television watching. We see this same pattern when we examine family labor. Most women describe the objectively uneven distribution of household work as fair. Hochschild argued that women give up leisure as an indirect strategy to bolster a myth of equality. Rather than resenting his leisure time, a woman uses the time during which her male partner is pursuing his own interests to engage her interests of housework and childcare. Overall, she divine, defines their level of involvement at, ho at home as equal, a view that can only be sustained, Hochschild said, if she ignores her own lack of leisure and the amount of leisure her partner has. Hochschild also said that women see their male partner's leisure time as more valuable than their own, and they justify this by saying that more of his identity and time are committed to paid work so he deserves the extra relaxation. In both Hochschild's and Compter's views, women can't afford to feel resentment in their close relationships. The data here suggest that the exercise of power around couples' television watching behavior can be overt and relentless. Women's resistance strategies, such as getting a second television set or using the VCR, are also ways of doing gender. They do little to upset the power dynamics. Indeed, most women whose male partners are excessive grazers do not describe resistance strategies. Instead, they maintain the status quo. The data from the lesbian and gay couples offer some hope. In conjunction with the data from the heterosexual pairs, they suggest that in most of these couples, it's typical for one person to use the RCD more than the other. Yet one lesbian partner who has been in her relationship for nine years suggested a solution to the conflict between partners when one is distressed by the other's RCD behavior. When asked, is there anything else you'd like to tell us? She responded, well, I think the most important thing for me is to remember to be sensitive to, fa to the fact that she doesn't have the taste, same taste as me, and I try to think about that. And if she mentions that she likes something, then I ask her before I change the channel, are you done watching it, or are you still interested? And then, may I change the channel? By elevating the importance of her partner's wishes to the level of her own, she demonstrates the consideration and care that Hochschild and Thompson would say her partner desires and deserves. Perhaps these women, this woman, with her honesty to herself and her sensitivity to her partner, and her concern about the way in which her own behavior is or could be a problem in her relationship is doing gender too. 
She is concerned with the relationship rather than with getting her own way. This is how women are said to make connection and to demonstrate care. Through these strategies, they maximize joint enjoyment of leisure and minimize power imbalances. Rather than reproducing structural hier hierarchies, they create a bond of equality and provide a different course for the resolution of inherent conflict within couples. Recently, my partner and I toured new homes in the Portland area billed as the Street of Dreams, a half dozen homes costing nearly a million dollars each. Each year, such homes are built in the Portland area and open temporarily to a curious public that will never be able to afford them. <laughs> Inside one was a home theater room with three television sets mounted next to each other along the back wall. A moment after we arrived, a middle-aged heterosexual couple entered the room. The woman smiled and said to the man, look, Bob, you could get rid of the remote. <clears throat> if three television sets in one room is a potential solution to the problem of being able to watch only one show at a time, gendered struggles inherent in such mundane everyday activities are destined to continue. They will do so as long as macro level structural forces continue to influence and be strengthened by micro level processes. Thank you.